Welcome to DaVinci's Discourse, where the minds of today's most innovative entrepreneurs are unveiled and explored. And my name is Kyle Campbell, your guide on this journey into the depths of the entrepreneurial psyche. So sit back, relax, and get ready to dive into the minds of the greats. This is DaVinci's Discourse. I love it, man. So Dave, dude, it's awesome to have you here, man. Why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself? If somebody were to ask who you are, what would you tell them? Um, it's always a, an interesting question to self-define because identity yeah. is a is a piece of who you are. Uh, I would probably do some around uh, professionally. I'm a professor, um, university, and do a bit of consulting, quite a bit of writing, research on people and organization. I'm a um, father of three kids and 10 grandkids, and I uh, try to live my faith. So those would be probably the triangle uh, of the things that define me. Mm, I love it. I love the, you, you, it is the triangle, right? It's the, the yeah. Holy Trinity in a way. I mean, it's, it's the three pillars of, of a good life lived. So uh, let's get into perhaps. the first one a little bit, perhaps. So I got to ask you, but before, how would you, def- people probably don't ask you back. How would you question. define yourself? Um, pure infinite intelligence in space encapsulated in an ego as I speak with you right now. So it's a pure consciousness, ever, ever gaping purity. That's the essence of all of us that I believe. And then we're filtering that through our ego, which we're able to present to the world and have this conversation right now. Uh, be able to, to eat some some pasta and know that it's your mouth that you're putting it in, not somebody else's. Uh, so that's, that's how right. I define it. So there's kind of the two layers of it. The self, as Carl Jung would talk about, and then the ego. So there's um, the, the two lenses that I look at that answer as. What do you that's think? Great. I think it's great. I mean, it ego, super ego, some of that psychological background is is useful to see but i always think it's fun um and i think personal brand or personal identity is always one of those issues that that shapes our self-image of how we define ourselves as seen by others what do i want others to know me for and so navigating that that becomes very important Right. And then that comes down to the personas that you're developing, which Carl Jung says overlaps the ego. It's kind of the outer layer of it. And the persona is is what we want to pre- present ourselves as to, to other people with you in this case. Uh, for example, if in this podcast, I've got a persona that's different from how I might hang out with my grandmother, you know? So it's like uh, two different personas, same person, but uh, two different um projected identities yeah so well and that's some of the uh, marketing research that you've obviously covered in other sessions where you do taxonomy or topology to define what those personas look like fascinating question so i uh it's always tricky to define um our identity but those would be the three dimensions i guess professional uh personal in terms of family and uh, faith in terms of values Beautiful, man. So let's get into the first one a little bit. I think that's where we can provide the most amount of value here today. Uh, If somebody were to ask you what you do, we can just go into that realm and and we'll see where it kind of branches off from there. I think what we do is best taught by a story. I was uh, on my way to law school decades ago and took a course in what's called organizational behavior. OB Mm, mm. captivated me. The professor said, I don't have anything to do. Go look at the organizations where you live, where you work, where you worship, where you do stuff write about it. I was an English major on my way to law school. So I started writing about organizations, uh, paradise lost, the great organizational philosophy. Uh, anyway, yeah. I turned it in uh, Shakespeare, how we manage power in King Lear. And I turned it into my English professor and I turned it into him. And the English professor said, this is wacko. <laughs> and he said, this is fascinating. Keep doing it. Uh, Interesting. Him, I wrote 15, 10 page papers. Uh, he called me and he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to law school. He said, oh, don't do that. Come <laughs> study organizations. And uh, I called my parents. I've told this story before. And I said, I'm not going to go into law school. I'm going to go into OB. And they were delighted. You're going to be a doctor. Uh, and I said, no, I'm not going to be a doctor. Not quite. <laughs> I'm going to go study organizations. So uh, my passion for 40 years has been how do organizations shape the way we think, act, feel, and live? Mm. And how do you build an organization that creates value for others in a way that builds our lives, the the things you're talking about, the the persona, the the ego. But I, I learn who I am in relation to others. So what I do is I I I remember when I was a doctoral student, 
there was a, there was a sign we'll uh, we'll consult for food. <laughs> uh, they didn't have any money, but I work in organizations, big, small. Uh, write books, do research. How do you build an organization that creates value for someone else? And that's got a lot of dimensions. No kidding. I mean, we can get into some of those dimensions. It's almost like a massive multifaceted gem where it's just a, a, an infinite amount of, of complexity that you can look at the lens through. Uh, let's that's a Rubik's it. cube. I mean, yeah, let's get into yeah. it. Cause that's, <laughs> that's what my wife, just to give you a joke, she's in the background of my thing, a very, very well-known psychologist. She said, I have OCD which is organization compulsive disorder. <laughs> I reorganize every organization. I was at dinner the other night with a friend and I said, you know, as I look at this restaurant, I think I could get them a five to 7% increase in productivity. Can I talk to the manager? <laughs> and my friend said, Dave, calm down. It's okay. There, you, you don't need to do that at dinner, but I, that's what I do. I You're love consulting to think for about food it. again. You got the sign up. We'll consult for food. <laughs> that's true. That's true. I should I have done it. it. So, what are some things? Let's let's take this step by step. Let's say that I was a consulting client of yours, and you're looking at my organization. We're looking to optimize it. Where would we start in terms of being able to to reorganize it in a way? So, that's more pick one of your businesses. Let's role play it. My first one is, you don't succeed with the organization. You succeed in the marketplace. That organization is not about who we are. It's about how we are that creates value for others. So, my first question would be. Describe the environment and marketplace you're trying to succeed with. What, who's the customer? Why would they look at you? What is it you offer them that will create value for them? And, and that could be a whole host of things. It could be a product, it could be a service, it could be a price, it could be something. How does the AI knowledge you bring create value for a customer? So that's where you start. Mm, then, yeah. I, then I begin to say, and, and, I begin to say, so what is it you do inside your organization to begin to realize that? And I, I love research. Mm. Um, my PhD, my undergraduate degrees in English, my PhD is in taxonomy, which is research. I like to look at four dimensions of an organization. One is people, talent, people, two, it's culture, systems, capabilities, three, it's leadership and four, the underlying HR services. So I'd say, Kyle, well, let me just ask, what's something you're trying to give your customers? What? Why would a customer come to you instead of one of the other? And, then, and there's pop-up high-tech AI firms that are great. Why well, would a customer come to you? In my mind, was a feeling, of, a feeling of certainty. Uh, that's that, at the end of the day, that's what I'm presenting. If, if it's clients that are coming in, what they're really after is a feeling of safety. Um, that's that's the core of it, I guess, from the primal level. And then comes the the kind of tactical, you know, more clients, uh, X, Y, Z, better website, uh, better perceived, um, you know, brand persona. Um, it kind of it actually kind of goes back to the the, the ego and the, the 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 map of the psyche, and that's kind of projected onto an organization. But Dan, yeah, to answer your question, I would say at the core of it, it's it's safety and um, self actualization. You could say. Uh, individualization. And I'm contributing to that through the the net of safety that I'm providing by getting them clients. Um, That's super. I know you've talked to David Acker, who is phenomenal. I love his work because he talks about brand. And you say, well, what's the brand? And you're saying, I, Kyle, my company wants, what's the name of your company? Uh, well, I've got a few. Let's go with uh, company agent.ai. It's the agency that I run. Agent.ai. What's the brand? What is it we want to be known for by the customer? So they pick us and it's safety, it's delivering great services. It's, it's, it, that's the identity. What I love to do is say, take that external identity, the brand that David Acker, and we've used his metaphors. It's phenomenal. You create a brand, you create an identity, and that identity allows you to be successful. What does that mean you have to do with the four dimensions? Your people. What kind of people would your customers want to be interacting with so they could feel safe? They could feel your technological excellence. What would be the characteristics of the people? Second, organization. What would be the culture? What would they want to feel in terms of the way of working, the way you work with them? Third, what would they want to see in you as the leader? We write, we write about leadership brand. Do your behaviors reflect the promises you make them? And fourth, what are the HR systems, staffing, training, development, compensation, all that infrastructure stuff that makes it happen? And so what I love to do is go to a company and say, we want to be more successful. In fact, I start by saying, um, it was interesting. I did a talk in one of the, the, the four major technology companies, doesn't matter. They're all the same, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Apple. 
last year and there were a hundred senior executives, all of us, 70% had PhDs in physics, science, math. They were all smarter than I am. And I thought, how in the world am I going to get their attention? Because I an undergraduate degree in English. You get a degree reading books. And so I said the following, what do all of these companies have in common? And I started to list them. Digital equipment, Compact, Toys R Us, Sears, today it'd be GE. One of them yelled out, they all went broke. And I yelled back, I consulted for every one of them. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> and they stopped and they laughed. I said, you know, I took Kodak from 100,000 to 20,000. I took digital from 120 <laughs> to zero, compact. And they laughed and they said, oh, you're either really stupid or gutsy. <laughs> and and the takeaway was, and I said, I'm going to take you right down with me. <laughs> the takeaway was every one of those companies, Kodak, they made film. An amazing product, three feet of acetate, one inch wide, sell for three bucks. I mean, yeah. cost 30 cents. They didn't start with the marketplace. They didn't understand the changing expectations. Mm -hmm. And so they missed. Toys R Us missed. They didn't get Amazon that you can sell toys through the internet, through uh, online. Digital equipment missed the software business. And, and so I said to this company, don't start your organization culture with who you think you are. Start it with David Acker. And so I love his stuff. What is it we want to be known for by those customers so that they will continue to buy our product? That's the agenda I try to build. And then mm -hmm. talent, organization, leadership, and HR become the levers to do it. Interesting. Okay. I mean, it's fascinating what you're talking about. The question is, how do you know what to what answers to give somebody when it comes to them answering that question and or those questions and being able to come back with a a strategic plan? Because somebody watching this or listening to this could go back and, and actually answer each one of those questions the same way that they would if you were consulting for them. But then what's the next step in terms of how to know what to do with it? I love to get concrete. Um, and here's what you do. Many companies have statements of values. I don't know if your your AI company has a statement of value. What would be a value in a company? We value innovation. We value stability, safety. You just talked about that as a criteria. Here's what I'd say to the entrepreneur. Don't define the values through your lens, but through the customer lens. So if you're an entrepreneur and you say, here's the brand we're trying to build, brand values, whatever it is, safety, innovation, collaboration, go to your customers, either current or future, Ask them three questions. Number one, are these the values you want us to have? Mm -hmm. They'll almost always say, you know, yeah, safety, that's good. Collaboration, that's good. Innovation, that's good. Question two gets more relevant. What do you need to see from us to show that we live them for you? In other words, what does safety mean to you? What does innovation mean to you? Uh, yeah. What does collaboration mean to you? And they then define the behavior. So as an entrepreneur, most entrepreneurs are incredibly bright, dedicated, hardworking. You love to define the behaviors you want to create. I would argue, don't go there. Let mm. the customer define yeah. those behaviors. Mm. Because when the customer, and, and here's an example, service is not defined by what you give, it's what the customer gets. I don't know if you travel a lot, you probably do. Do you like to check bags or not check bags? Zero check bags, man. 36 countries, never checked a single bag. <laughs> Neither have I. Yeah, I've done a week long <laughs> cruise and not checked a bag. Second question. You've done a red eye flight to pick a country, Dubai or Santiago. You're tired. It's 1 a.m. You've got to get up at 6 to a meeting. The car drops you off at the hotel and somebody comes out, opens the trunk, grabs your bag and says, I'm going to give you a great service, Kyle. I'm going to carry your bag to your room. You like that or not like that? I just said, just do it. Don't tell me you're going to do it. <laughs> what I say is, that's not service to me. I've carried this bag 12,000 miles. I can take it into my room. I don't have change. I don't want to wait 30 minutes. Yeah, right. And there have been a time or two when recently I was in Oman. Great hotel, late at night. I'm up early. And I almost got in a fist fight with a poor guy carrying my bag. <laughs> Give me my bag. Now, what's the metaphor? I define service. I'm yep. the customer. Right. So let the customer define the service. For me, service is speed. <laughs> Get me to my room. I want to be asleep. So Question one, are these the values you want us to have? Question two, very concrete. What's the behavior from the customer point of view that would define it? Then question three, when we do that behavior, will you buy more from us? Interesting. Hmm. I um, did a talk with one of those 
big groups, Davos, Wobi, Ted, one of those big groups, 1,500 senior business leaders. And they said, here's the guy going to talk about organization, culture. And they said, oh, bring a pet to work, shin kumbaya. Oh, no, God. that's not what we're about at no. all. And I went through that and they said, you mean culture, the organization is not just warm, fuzzy stuff. It's getting the customer to buy more from us because we behave in ways that are meaningful to him or her. Yeah, mm. that's what we're trying to create. And that's the agenda that I have. I love that, man. And it starts really at the top and it kind of permeates down throughout the organization. The question becomes, the answers you gave- Can I tweak that? Can I tweak yeah, I think it start. starts outside in, not at the top. I don't think it well, starts okay. at the leader. I, I think I, it starts with the customer. Okay, I really got it. it should, okay. right? But, but it depends on how the leader is perceived and perceiving the target audience. And so Absolutely. you see what I mean? And, and then that permeates well, throughout yep. the organization. Yep. yep. And I, I love, and that's what we love about it. David Acker's stuff on brand is phenomenal. I mean, I, I, I become his ambassador, his apostle, his disciple. I, I preach it. He does a great job defining the brand in the marketplace. We love to then say, so leader, is your behavior, we call it leadership brand, consistent with what you promised your customer? Mm, and then it wow. goes from the top and it filters all the way through. The question becomes, how do you know what is going to be, because like the answers to those three questions that you gave, for example, with the luggage, um, that's going to be different from, from my answer, for example. Um, and it depends on where I'm at at the time of day and everything. If it's in, if they're overly aggressive with it, then it's like, oh, just, I don't want it, man. You know, just, you know, um, but your answer is going to be different from somebody else's answer. And, and so it comes down to finding the sort of um, great comment. Great comment. Of, of and, and one of the things we know in marketing is we have customized. And that's what AI lets you do. I mean, the, uh, yeah. your businesses, I assume, you track my information, you track my data, you got all the cookies, you know exactly how much Diet Coke I'm going to drink in a day. And I know what's <laughs> yeah. in your bottle. And uh, I hope your bottle is good. And, uh, and, and I think we have to build organizations that personalize. So you customize outside, you personalize inside. What about in terms of the tactics that you can use to personalize? Because it's, it's difficult. You name some of them just there. But yeah. I mean, this is a, a high tech solution of it. What are some of the classic ones that maybe we can re reinvent or take back into our organizations as opposed to the, the, the new stuff that everybody's talking about? Uh, what are some ways that in the past that they've done um, hyper personalization? Some really fun stuff is to say to an employee, it starts with what matters most to you. Uh, 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 the employees you've got in your companies are pretty good. If they're not good, you don't want them. And if they're good, they've got opportunity elsewhere. So yeah. Peter Drucker, the, the father of this field said, most employees are volunteers, not that they work for free, but they choose where they work. And, um, and money is a threshold. And so I'm going to think money, most of those folks, it's not money. I can go get money. What is it that matters most to you? Is it, take yours is it being safe physically psychologically is it belief meaning purpose is it becoming better and learning is it belonging to a community what is it that matters to you as an employee that will allow you to feel like you're doing your best efforts once you get that mm. answer you can say to that employee mm. if you perform well this is a quid pro quo you're going to get what you want i'll give again it'd be fun to hear yours mine i'm a professor at the university um, but I like autonomy. I, uh, I like flexibility. I like autonomy. And so the Dean says, Dave, you like autonomy. You don't really want to live in the Midwest in Michigan in the winter. Um, you want to live in Utah. That's where I live today. We'll do that for you. If you continue to produce and if you continue to be effective, we'll create a personal value and employee value proposition. So if I'm an entrepreneur, I want to bring in the very best people and I want to create a value proposition that works for them and for me. What is it you want? What mm. makes your work meaningful to you? We're willing to do that if you in turn can create what we need so that we create a virtuous Love cycle. That. Yes. Mm. So you do that with every individual employee and you, you're able to, I mean, because what if you've got a thousand employees? I mean, it's, it's, it's very difficult to, to tailor your solution to each one. And well, then you create patterns. Control. What kind of car do you drive? I'll demonstrate this. Okay, right you now. Realize I'm gonna I'm gonna interview you. This is cool. Come on, baby, bring it on. Let's switch it around. Uh, right now, it's a Mitsubishi. Super. When you go to buy a car, if you looked at every single option, color of steering wheel, seats, carpets, etc., it's overwhelming. I mean, it's it's you know 50 options and it's 50 factorial, so 50 times 49. Yeah, it's just 5,000 SKUs. Yeah. Yeah. So, what do the car companies do? 
they bundle. Hey, I hope you're enjoying the podcast. And I want to let you know that I've got a free book that you can get if you want to tap into more of these resources. And you can get that for free at kylesbook.com. Back to the podcast. I'm going to go buy a Mitsubishi and I've got four option packages, sport option and comfort option, whatever they are. That's what I think leaders do. They begin to say, we're going to personalize, but we're going to bundle. Mm. And you did it before, your comment of persona. My PhD is in taxonomy. Taxonomy is the science of organization. We have a thousand people, but when we study it, we can peak some bundles. And so we bundle the options of how you're going to go about doing it. And the second piece is we create a menu, not a choice. Have you ever eaten at the Cheesecake Factory? <laughs> no. <laughs> I oh, live in Canada, oh, man, should. so we don't have a Cheesecake Factory up here. <laughs> uh, what would be the example? Uh, Tim Hortons. It doesn't there matter. There you go. Yeah, I've had um, eaten at Tim Hortons. <laughs> uh, of course. Um, well, how many items on a menu at Tim Hortons? A hundred. Sure. So what do they do to personalize? They put them in categories. Yeah, Appetizers. Salad, soups, desserts. Yeah. So what you've got is five categories, then choices in each. That's the value of what we call taxonomy or an integrated framework. Yeah. So the employee, here's the categories of things we can give you. You pick from that menu what works for you. So we personalized. You and I, if we went to Tim Hortons, we'd probably buy different things. Look at you and look at me. I, you know, I, <laughs> I want the donut with chocolate glaze. You uh, want the salad with, uh, with the, uh, with no, anyway. Um, so we personalize from a common menu, and yeah. that's what I think entrepreneurs should do. How tactically can we do that? Because let's like, say you've got, because there are different categories. There's the accounting department, the marketing department, the sales department. And then within those, I can see you bulking or, or sort of packaging together different options. Work at home, do X, Y, Z, uh, come to the office, uh, do, do ABC, exactly. Yep. Right? Where do you want to work? We'd love to personalize work. Here's the choices, uh, really two, home Human office. Choices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, now remember, you got to say, we got to get the outcome. But we have the choice and we're going to standardize some. Most companies in hybrid work today are saying we're going to be in the office two to three days a week and overlap because we need to be together. So Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, we're going to be in the office. And then you're going to personalize the other. Do you want to be five? Do you want to be three? And and we let you make your choice. And then we build the organization around that personalization. It's a little bit like customizing clothes. Um, I hmm. love that idea because for an entrepreneur, it allows me to build um, – uh, a consistent relationship with my employee and, and yet personalize it. That's where we're, that's where we're headed. What are some correlations you find in the map of the psyche that, that kind of tail over to the, the map of an organization? Because I think they're, they're very similar in a way. There's the facade, uh, they're the face that you present to the public, and then there's the inner workings. How do you look at the, the two together? Uh, they should co they should, the, the correlation should be high. Yeah. In fact, we, we've done a cool, if you're an entrepreneur, one of the great insights, and again, why I start outside in, not just at the top, not with you, the entrepreneur, but with the customer, Yeah. the correlation between employee attitude inside and customer attitude outside is usually 0.6 to 0.8. So if I want my customers to feel that they're getting a great experience, if I want to go to Metro or I want to go to one of the other stores in Canada, I'm, we lived in Montreal for three years. So I'm trying hey, to remember. Where all great. That's where I'm at right now. <laughs> where, are you, where are you? And uh, well, right now it's Cote St. Luke, but uh, there's. Oh, that's cool. We live in Ville oh, okay. uh, okay, okay. for three Beautiful. years. And I spoke uh, terrible French. Me too. Um, terrible. It's awful. <laughs> <laughs> but. But if we want to build a good employee or customer serve attitude at a, the Metro stores, in fact, what's fun is, is uh, again, I, I'm, I'll give you the research and then apply to an entrepreneur. How many uh, metro stores are there in Canada? 500. If you listed the 500 metro stores by customer satisfaction, so we measure some form of customer engagement, net promoter score, those who shop that store, and you list the employee engagement in those stores with whatever engagement, their productivity, their satisfaction, blah, blah, blah. The correlations are 0.6 to 0.8. So I'm an entrepreneur. What does my customer want from me? How do I get an employee who gives that and make sure that the employee is having a positive experience? Because the employee experience is going to transfer yeah. to the customer experience. These things That's the transfer. research that we've done. I mean, it's yeah. so fascinating, man, because these things do transfer. Because you think about it, 
uh, in a sales situation, for example, right to the ground floor of the of the organization where the trade takes place, the the mindset of the salesperson, if they go into it with a a certainty that they will close the sale, there's a higher, there's a much higher chance and likelihood of of the sale actually closing, as opposed to them being kind of you know hesitant at maybe hopefully I close the sale. And then the customer feels that and that certainty doesn't transfer. And so what you're saying is it's not only the certainty that transfers, but it's it's the entire morale, the 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 mindset of that Absolutely. individual and every employee that connects with the customers that all trains and the employee embodies the company culture i mean yeah. my image That's of tim job. hortons is not what the executives do it's what the people in the local tim hortons do and yeah. uh and begin to see that i uh well there's two places i could go with your comments which i really like let me go with one because you've used the word three times certainty okay we live in a world of uncertainty do you have do you have brothers sisters children do you have no you no know, no, all no, I can be certain about is uncertainty. That's that's about it. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna push that. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think how to anchor this. So I'll I won't use you as a case study here. I'll use someone else. I'm in a session this week. Somebody says the world's uncertain. It's terrible, and I say uh, the woman I was working with. You have a daughter who's 14. Do you know where she's going to go to school? No. Do you know what she's going to study? No. Do you know who she might form a relationship with? No. You know where she's going to live? No. Do you know anything about your daughter? I guess not. Wrong. Do you love your daughter? Mm. And every time I have that discussion, the feel, the mood changes. Yeah. Mm. Will you love her no matter what? Yeah. You know where she's going to go to school, study, work. I think we live in a world of uncertainty. My view is in a world of uncertainty, don't chase the uncertainty. Focus on the certainty. What do I know for sure? Mm. Even in a world that's uncertain, and, I'll, 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 and 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 I know we have three kids and ten grandkids. There they are somewhere, some of them back there, and uh, in the back of my thing. I know I will love my kids. They've tested that, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and that's okay. Yeah. But I know I will love my kids. I know that uh, when COVID hit, I've traveled a lot, I, uh, all over, all the time, under two hundred flights a year for twenty years. COVID hit, not traveling. I'm completely lost. What am I going to do? Am I going to go to work? Am I going to quit? Am I going to do something else? And finally, it hit me. What am I certain about? And I'd love to, <laughs> we're doing a coaching session with you as I talk. That's so fun. I am certain that I'm going to learn. That's my passion. Yeah. And I'm going to learn in ways that help others. That's my certainty. Um, that may be a video conference. I never did video before. I'm still not very good at this stuff, but I'm going to learn. So I'd love to say to you, Kyle, in a world, you don't know the future. You don't know if you're going to have three companies or 50. Are they going to grow? Are they going to shrink? Is AI going to take off? Is it going to get regulated? Who's going to win the American election? Uh, you know, We do know it's going to be an octogenarian. So we do know something. That's kind of bad. But, but <laughs> what am I, Kyle, certain about in a world that's unpredictable and uncertain? That's my core values. That's my identity where we started. I see. Mm. See, and so, yeah, what would, uh, go ahead. I love your response. What I would say to that is you're going to the certainties for comfort at the end of the day, right? There's, because you found discomfort in, in the lack of, of certainty or the lack of control. This is where I'm going with this, with COVID, for example, right? And so these, seeking these certainties are kind of giving you a feeling of control because you have control over these certainties and that's it, right? But I'm, what I'm thinking is, uh, like for example, Eastern philosophy, the, the the idea of giving up absolute control of the result, being completely okay and at peace and at one with the fact that there is no is no certainty. Um, your daughter could something could happen, and there we could not be a daughter. There's that certainty is even the certainty could could be uncertainty. And I'm going to push. It, okay, I please. will love my daughter. I will love my daughter. I'm not going to walk away from that. I will. That is certainty. I look at the things behind you and I think the symbols we have in our offices, and I assume that's your real, you chose those. Yeah. They sort of become, this is David Acker stuff again. The, the, the office space, the accoutrements sort of signal what we believe. 
So yes. tell me a story from one of those three pictures or the beads. I don't know what the beads mean. Uh, <laughs> the beads are, they're, um, it's amber that I got when I was on a trip in Latvia. And there's a story behind the whole Latvia trip. So that's what those represent. But one, the one I like the best is uh, love is the answer. And I put, that I, just there, said, yeah. I put that there tactically because what I want to do is unconsciously have a correlation with love and me. So if I'm talking with a client, they're unconsciously associating me with love. And so that I, I hypothetically will improve my close ratio and also it will help to have a, a deeper connection with the guests on the podcast, for example. Right. So that's, that's the story behind that. And so, so the, the certainty you've got is I'm pretty certain, pretty that certain, if I can be pretty certain that yeah. if I communicate love with Einstein holding it, I mean, that's the paradox because you got the genius and the, and the affect, the intellect and the, and the emotional, yeah. if I can communicate that in a way that's meaningful to others, I think I'm going to have more success. That's a degree of certainty. That's it's a cool. theory that I have some it's certainty, enough certainty to put the, to put the sign up. Yeah. Yeah. To send a signal. I mean, it's a signal to what we have. I have a signal in my office of Martin Luther King, great That's activist awesome. of Sheikh Zayed, great activist um, of my family. <laughs> my wife put the picture up about eight months ago. She said, "You also need a picture of me." <laughs> said, okay, that's good. But. Um, but I think those, and my dad is in that picture. The pictures, I think, give us a memory of what am I going to try to live where we started in terms of my values, my certainty. With my kids, I'm going to love them. With my clients, I assume there's a certainty you want your clients to believe in about you. And that, again, this is now, if we mentioned David Acker 10 yeah, times, I want, a, I want a free book. Um, <laughs> but, but that brand is a bit of a certainty the the car i buy the clothes i wear it, it begins to communicate do i have any clothes here that are a certainty um uh, what have i got here uh we oh i do ha somebody gave me a mont blanc pen nice that's a fancy pen that's a brand yeah it's a sign of respect it's a sign of value it's a sign of it's a certainty in some ways of what of what they're trying to and mont blanc is very committed to that certainty disney is committed to that certainty that you will have a good experience when you come to our theme park. Apple is committed to the innovation certainty. When I use Apple, I uh, my phone, wherever it is, I will have a more certainty about the Apple innovation. Google is committed to using information, Amazon to an efficient delivery of their service. When we, as an entrepreneur, what am I personally and what is my company certain about as we work with our clients and customers? That's the work that I try to do. It's so difficult, man, though, because like, look at you're, you're, you're extracting certainty from perception, which you can never be certain about. It's like why I don't look at psychology as a science, because there's, it, 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 there's, it's not like physics, for example. And so you're talking about perception of certainty, but the perception could change. I mean, uh, for, for every positive, there's a negative. There's a, there's a flip side, for example, with the Mont Blanc pen, somebody, the certainty that they're trying to instill in the customer base is that this represents value and high and, and prestige and illustriousness and, and maybe uh, a certain level of status that comes along with that. But to another individual, maybe a, a tree hugging hippie kind of a, a hippie dippy kind of a dude is, is going to look at that as, as uh, all the, the capitalists, the whatever, you know what I mean? So there's always the different, the other perception, the, the other side. And which of the one as a, as a leader of your company, which one do you want the customer to know you for? That's the question I ask leaders. Because I think our job as leaders is to begin to say, this is the certainty. I, if I'm at Mont Blanc, guess what? There's going to be, there's always going to be naysayers. I mean, that's that's inevitable. But this is what I want us to be known for. Disney, I want us to be right. known for a great experience. I just want us to be known for an incredible experience for those who come to the theme park. I want those to have a great experience when you shop in our stores, when you do a Disney cruise. That's what we're trying to build. And if I'm an entrepreneur, the more there's going to be all variants. Variance is inevitable. And 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 well, see, that's and what it means. It's paradoxical. How can how, how can you have certainty well, when 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 that's inevitable? It's, it's, so it's well, you're certain though. In that paradox, where am I going to play? Where am I going to play? Right. The okay. paradox is another great issue. All of our research, and we do a ton of research. That's what we yes. love. Yes. Um, the key to leadership success is navigating that tension. You succeed because you don't manage uh, the paradox. You don't do away with it. You navigate it. Mm. And you begin to say, okay, in that world of uncertainty, this is where I'm going to play. And I'm going to navigate that so that I can try to be successful. So my advice where you started with uh, entrepreneurs who I hope are listening, start outside in. 
Don't start just inside your head. Start outside. Who are the customers today, tomorrow, the future, and the investors? I don't think you'd live without financing, equity, debt, parent, whoever they are. What is the identity we want to be known for in that marketplace? That's the outside in. How do we bring that external identity inside to our people, our organization, our leadership, my leadership at the top? Mm. And how do you weave that into your HR systems? Can I give one example? Please. Big company. Doesn't matter who it is. Um, salesperson, you use sales. The, the rubber hits the road when the salesperson and the, and the customer have an interaction. I'm in HR. I say to you, Kyle, you're the salesperson. Can we go visit Julia customer? And you go, why would HR come? <laughs> and I say, I'm HR. I'm here to help. By the way, if your HR person says that, fire them. That's a horrible line. <laughs> but I come. So you visit with Julie, the customer, and you sell her a product or service. She looks at me and says, who are you? <laughs> and I go, I'm from HR. And here's what I say to her. Thank you so much for letting me join Kyle. He's great at sales. He knows how to build the, sell the product or service. Let me tell you what I've learned. I now know better what you want from us as a company in terms of our features, in terms of our characteristics, in terms of the speed with which we act. I have a sense now of what your brand is, what your identity is. I come from HR. I'm going to go back at how we look at how we hire people, pay people, train people, organize, communicate. I'm going to look at our policies so that we can get more people who do what you seem to need done. And here's why. Currently, we have 40% of what you buy. You buy 40% from us, 60% from B, C, and D. We want 60% next year. Kyle has sold you a product. I want to build with you a relationship. And I'm going to involve you in hiring, paying, training, developing our people so that that relationship gets you what you want and allows us to have a long-term commitment with you. I think that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of work that I see as an entrepreneur. You start with a great idea. You start with a great product that serves a marketplace. Then we institutionalize it and the firm begins to grow and develop. Amazon's a great example. I mean, they started in 94 with the, um, with uh, technology distributing or disrupting the, the the market for stuff, they're not playing. They're still playing in that space, but their margins are pretty small because everybody's playing. Now it's Amazon Web Services because they're playing in a whole different market position. Apple, the same thing. I mean, Apple's in eight or nine different businesses, and and they're always doing that logic by looking outside in, and then building inside what will build a relationship with the customer outside. Boy, I'm babbling. That's no, the dude, stuff that I'm beautiful. passionate about. I can tell. That's oh, the stuff I'm it, it's beautiful. It, what you're talking about is instead of projecting your own values and what you want to be known for and what you think that the problems that need to be solved are, you're you're collecting the feedback and you're shaping your internal organization based off of the the the, the target audience. And for Mont Blanc, it's it's they're not going after the the hippies who are going to look at capitalism negatively, uh, as opposed to uh, the the target audience they're going for is is somebody who is looking for maybe status and and the X Y Z criterion that they're looking that you know that this yeah you uh, made me feel audience. funny now i'm a status guy because i have a pen i, I got cool. one too man but i use it but i use it every single freaking day is it a fountain pen or is it a what, what no, kind it's of a rollerball i like the rollerball okay now, like the somebody pen. gave it to me my friend wayne gave it to me <laughs> and and Thank again you. now i'll go the other way uh, what kind of watch do you wear uh, i used to have a rolex but i sold it um now i don't have a watch let me show you mine i don't know if people can see it i have a timex Nice. This is why personal brand is so I have a Timex watch. My father, who's uh, in the picture back here, worked for the government for 30 years. He built campgrounds, huh. barely got his degree. He said, I got the lowest grade point average in the history of my university. Just got through. Built campgrounds, Forrester. I have a PhD. I write books, do talks. He got me 20 years ago a Timex watch. And here's what he said. Dave, I'm really proud of you. You're doing all kinds of cool stuff. Wear Timex watch. Because the brand for me as your father is, I don't care what you've written. I don't care what you've done professionally. I care about you as a person. So mm -hmm. I'm wearing a Timex watch. Not, And I might even be able to get a better one if I could. 
<laughs> this is my fifth or sixth time. By the way, they're cheaper than Rolex when they break. Uh, they're twenty nine ninety five. <laughs> and uh, but when I when I when I start saying, "Oh man, this is so cool what I'm doing," I look at my Timex watch and I hear my father's voice saying, "Don't look around you. Look mm. inside." Mm. That's the value of brand. I mean, that's the value of a personal. That's what I want to be certain about. Our son did his PhD. What do you want for your gift? I want to go to Disney. So we took him and his family to Disney. And then I gave him a Timex watch. And I said, <laughs> I'm so proud you got your PhD. And I don't care. We're a Timex <laughs> watch. Uh, so that's the kind of message that I hope gets us reflecting. I hope those who are listening are going, yeah, what's the message I want to share? Hmm not only in my head, but with my clients, customers, but also with my employees and yeah. with my posterity. I mean, whatever that posterity looks like. Right. Because one transfers to the other with the, you know, like exactly what we're talking about. So man, I think that's a beautiful place to wrap it up. Um, one last question that I always like to ask, because I love the, the answers. It's always different. It's always fascinating to me. If I were to ask you a question that would uh, produce the greatest value for an entrepreneur watching, what would that question be? And then what's the answer to it? I'm going to give two, and it's a, a question and an answer. Okay. The question is, what do you think? Look what we did in the last 30 minutes of interviews. I'm betting you've done a lot of podcasts. One of my values as a learner is to ask you questions. I, I tried to ask you five or six questions. Ah, no kidding. So when somebody comes to you as an entrepreneur with an idea, instead of saying, let me judge that, first instinct, what do you think? What do you think? Uh, because yeah. that gets the person then reflecting. And sometimes their thinking is off. And you say, well, have you considered? So that's one tip. What do but you sometimes think? your thinking's off. And so by hearing and what I, you have to think, you, you adjust yours based on the, the new input. And they probably thought about it more than you. I, I mean, um, yeah, often. Yeah. So that's one. The, the other one, if I were giving, and again, we've written books and articles on leadership. One of my favorite simple tests of a good leader. How often, I'll put frame it as a question, do people leave an interaction with you feeling better or worse about themselves? Mm -hmm. Subjective. That's where we started. But, yeah. ah, and as an entrepreneur, often I have to give negative feedback. That's part of the game. Can right. I do that in a way that people feel better about themselves? If you, if you put that in your head, mm -hmm. those are my two questions. What do you think? How can I make sure you feel better about yourself after our interaction? You've made me feel a little better by your questions. I love your love is the answer with Einstein. That's an incredible paradox. I like the paradox. What's the, yeah. and, and, and I saw the amber. I was in New Orleans recently in Mardi Gras. They gave me a bunch of beads. I didn't bring them home because they have a different meaning. But but um, what's the woman dancing? What's the, what's the message of that one? It's a beautiful picture. I love it. It's Yeah, it, it touches my heart for some reason. Some That's the thing about art is we don't realize why we're attracted to it, which is something that I'm a big fan of. Um, the reason why it's there is, again, tactically, I like to uh, engage. The, the thinking there is most of the people that I deal with are, are men that I'm interacting with as clients and, and it's in this podcast. Lots of women, too, but more men than women. And so this is uh, to when you see a woman walking away from you, there is an inclination to want to to chase her. It's like men have this this desire to want to be uh, accepted and liked and so the thinking is it's like it's funny to to talk about this but this is this is the thinking that went behind it aside from the fact that i love the image um i want them to associate having um a feeling of almost miss missing out on something if they don't do business with me and so you know, I'm just trying to unconsciously have these little anchors, these little, these little touch points in there so that, and again, I don't know if it works. I'm not certain about it, but I am certain that the theory is, is at least credible in some way. And so well, what you're behind both of those stories, you're certain that you want to do something that engages your clients with you. Yes. Either absolutely. love is the answer, or I want to connect with this person. And I want to make sure that when people interact with me, they feel like they want to uh, continue the, the dialogue. That's cool. Thank you. <laughs> you got me, something. dude. You got me. You, you finished it off with a certainty that I don't have an uncertain answer to. So you win the debate. It's uh, <laughs> I'm not it's debate. That's pleasure. stupid. This isn't a debate. Fun. This is a joint learning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think it was a blast, man. So thank you so much for sharing your insights. And uh, we will keep in touch, my friend. Seriously. Beautiful conversation that unfolded. Thank you. Bien fait. Hey. C'est bon d'être à Montréal. <laughs> C'est bon. Merci beaucoup et au revoir. <laughs> à la prochaine.
Hey. All right. All right. I hope you enjoyed that podcast episode. And if you want to get a free copy of my book, go to kylesbook.com and you can get a copy there. I'll talk with you soon.